if you remember this theory, you'll remember everything. Right? So this is about the facial nerve. So now I'm going to just recap what I did in that diagram with you in the form of certain diagrams. So just to recap. Okay, so you already know that you have got an intracranial segment of the facial nerve in the form of nuclei. So let's just quickly draw the brainstem. We already know the major crux now. This is the brainstem, this is the midbrain, this is the pons. You know the facial nerve is coming out from the pons, right? All this nucleus, I'm just making one of it. And then after that, it is entering into something called as an internal acoustic meatus. And once it is entering into the internal acoustic meatus, it is called as a meatal segment. And then it is going into the ear. Now, what I'm here concerned with is this meatal segment. Because this is another important question for you. When I'm concerned about this meatal segment, I already know that it is around 8 millimeters. And this meatal segment has itself got this specific diagram inside. So if I cut this meatal segment, or not the meatal segment, cut the internal acoustic meatus, in short, what will I see? I'll see this diagram. Right? So don't get confused. This is nothing but the diagram. This is the ear from the top. This is the petrous part of the temporal bone. This is the sphenoid ridge. And this is the foramen magnum. So everything that was here from the brainstem is going to the internal acoustic meatus here. So I've cut section this internal acoustic meatus and what do I see? So in the internal acoustic meatus, there's not only the facial nerve that is running and going into the petrous part, there are other cranial nerves too, right? So what are the cranial nerves? So if you see this, the whole of the internal acoustic meatus from the inside is divided by a horizontal crest. That horizontal crest is called as a falciform crest. So this is called as falciform crest or the horizontal crest. Now there's an incomplete partition that comes down superiorly downwards and this is an incomplete partition called as a Bill's bar. It's just a bar which is cutting the superior part of the internal acoustic meatus, inferior part is not cut. It is continuous. So this vertical part, this has been given the name as Bill's bar. So now you have got the two cuts. Now let's see what is there inside them. So when I say this has specific to do with two important nerves, that is the seventh nerve and the eighth nerve. These two important nerves go through this or the internal acoustic meatus. So what is the seventh nerve? It's the facial. Eighth nerve is what? Vestibulocochlear. Let's break that into. Vestibulo means that it is again divided into superior vestibular nerve, inferior vestibular nerve. Cochlear division of vestibulocochlear nerve is a separate entity because cochlear is do, has to do with hearing. Vestibular has to do with balance. So let's see. This is the anterior part of the canal. This is the posterior part of the canal. So when I say anteriorly, anteriorly what are things are there? What is a mnemonic? You know a famous cold drink, 7-Up, and you remember Coke. So Coke down. That's how, how I remember it. So 7-Up means 7th nerve is up, right? 8, that means Coke. That means a cochlear division of the nerve is down. So just remember this small mnemonic. And then I told you the cochlear division also has certain vestibular divisions also, right? 8th nerve has to do with the balance also. That's why it's called as vestibular cochlear. So vestibular division of the eighth nerve, that is the superior vestibular nerve is up and the inferior vestibular nerve is down. Easy, right? This is in the posterior part, this is in the anterior part. Now one important nerve that has got to do with something with vertigo, that is the nervous intermedius also travels with the facial. That is seven up, that means anteriorly with the facial, there is one more nerve called as nervous intermedius. Right, so this is enough for internal acoustic meatus point of view. Now we know that what is that inside, okay? So let's just revise on what we did and let's see the course of the facial nerve. The facial nerve is already crossed. We have seen that it has crossed the, uh, uh, the internal acoustic meatus. It has entered into the petrous part of the temporal bone. We know there is a facial canal. That facial canal has been broken down into three major segments. That is the labyrinthine segment, tympanic segment, as well as the mastoid segment. So what till now we did was, this thing came down and what is that segment called? This segment is called as the labyrinthine segment. Now once it is entered, now this is a cross section that has been through and through inside the petrous part of the temporal bone. So we are seeing through that. We know that there is a delay point called as the geniculate ganglion. Then after that, it gives a turn. This is the first turn, first genu. Then it again turns, that is the second genu. Then after that, it comes down. And you see there is the first nerve that is given here. This is the nerve to stapedius. That's a motor branch. And then you see the scorda that is coming out and crossing to the other side and going as taste sensation fibers. But these are the sensory fibers. They are coming in. Right? Then it becomes a mastoid segment and then extracranial. 
quite right, right? So this is the facial canal, which has been shown in total, how these three parts are divided. Now let's see what all this facial canal has in particular. So this is a zooming up part of that facial canal into each part. And we have already known this. We already know everything about it, right? So I told you from the internal acoustic meatus up till the geniculate ganglion is what? It is the labyrinthine segment of the facial canal or the facial nerve, which is the narrowest one. It is only 0.64 to 0.68 millimeters in diameter. And the total length of it is around four millimeters. So it is the shortest as well as it is the narrowest segment of the facial nerve. That's why compression happens the most here, right? So this is the labyrinthine segment, which is going up till the geniculate ganglia. And we know that. Okay. After the labyrinthine segment, we see the second part. That is from the geniculate ganglion, now it gives a turn. That's called as the first genu, also called as an external genu. Don't get confused. Second will be that it will turn again. And what is this part called up till the pyramid? This part up till the pyramid is called as a tympanic part or the tympanic segment. So what is this? This is horizontal, right? So this is also called as a horizontal segment of the facial canal or the facial nerve which is traveling inside it. And then comes the last part that is from the pyramid up till the stylomastoid foramen. So this part, this is called as the mastoid segment. And if you see clearly, you can see the corda which is running to the opposite side, which is coming out from this segment. That means the fibers are coming down here and then they are traveling up. And we know how corda fibers travel. So this is coming out through the stylomastoid foramen and that is forming the extracranial segment. This is all about the facial nerve canal that you need to know. And this is all about the segments that you need to know. So this is as simple as if you break it into every part, you don't need to mug up on the symptoms also. You can yourself predict what all symptoms can come to a person if this nerve is involved. If a particular fiber is involved, the person is not able uh, to eat properly. The person is having distorted sensations of taste. Where are the fibers going? How they are behaving? This is why anatomy is so important when it comes to ENT. Because the ENT is all about seeing. That's what I told you, okay? So once it has come out from the mastoid segment through the stylomastoid foramen, it will become an extracranial part. Because now it is going out. And where will it go? It will go to a gland. And that's what we are going to see now. So this is the stylomastoid foramen. This is the part of the facial nerve, or the vertical part of the facial nerve, or the mastoid part of the facial nerve has finished. And then it has come out of the stylomastoid foramen becoming an extracranial part of the facial nerve. Right, so this is something that we'll focus on. How this extracranial part, uh, how are you producing those facial expressions? Have you ever thought of it? Now I'll tell you, okay? So let's focus upon the extracranial course now because we have actually dealt a lot of things intracranial. We have dealt a lot of things intrapetrous. We have seen how the facial nerve is traveling into various directions and dimensions. What all things can happen, right? So let's see now what are the extracranial courses all about. So you already know that there is a stylomastoid foramen. So let's say this is the ear and we already know that it has traveled at the junction of the posterior and the medial boundary of the middle ear. So suppose this is the facial canal. Suppose this is the facial canal. Okay. And then coming up from the geniculate ganglia. And now the facial nerve has come out. So let's draw the facial nerve. It's come out through this canal, stylomastoid foramen out. Now once this comes out, we know that it gives certain branches. And what were the branches? Second branchial arch derivatives, we have already seen in the motor root. It gives a branch that goes posteriorly behind the ear, that's called as posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. It gives off a muscle, that is a muscular branch to an important muscle called as a posterior belly of the digastric. And then it gives off another branch to a muscle which is attached to the styloid, called as the stylohyoid branch, or the stylohyoid nerve. Right? So this is something here. Now, after giving these branches, it goes ahead. And once it goes ahead, it enters into the parotid gland. The parotid gland is here. Okay. Now, once it enters into the parotid gland, it will divide into two major trunks. Now, what are these two major trunks? These are called as temporofacial trunk and cervicofacial trunk. So before becoming those five fibers that we know of, this divides into two major trunks. The upper trunk will give off the upper branches. And what are the upper branches? Temporal and zygomatic. And the cervicofacial one will give off the lower three branches. That is what the buccal, 
marginal mandibular and cervical. These are the five branches we know of. Right? So not to be confused of, these are the two main tracks that are formed. Then after that, it branches into five segments. Now, once it is traveling through here, it has got certain relations with two important structures. Now, what are the relations of those structures? If you draw, this is your parotid gland. Right? There's a cross section through the parotid gland. And I'm seeing the parotid gland is here, right? So your facial nerve is coming out through here, like this. And it is branching out into five things. Which is one thing that is associated with it or in relation with that? Very important vein that is running just posterior to it. And what is that vein that is running posterior to it? That is the retromandibular vein. And just behind the retromandibular vein is important, another important structure that is the external carotid artery. So if you see, there is a nerve, then comes the vein, and then comes the artery. This is the relation inside the parotid gland. Need not be very focused on, but this is very important because this is when we are doing a surgery, specifically when, when we are doing a parotidectomy. Then we need to know the structures that are coming in our way. The nerve will be the first one to encounter if we are going from the ear side outwards. So there will be the first, then there will be a nerve. Then there will be a vein, then there will be an artery. And we need to remember that, okay, because we are dealing with that. Right, so let's focus only on the facial nerve and not go into the details of the parotid gland. This is a picture that portrays exactly what I was telling you. If you can see, this is the part where it is coming out from the stylomastoid foramen. And then after that, it is becoming an extracranial part. In the extract, before coming to the parotid, it is giving off a branch called as posterior auricular nerve behind. It is giving a branch to this, that is the posterior belly of the digastric. Then also, you cannot see in this, but it is also giving a branch to the stylohyoid. Then it is entering into the parotid, and after getting into the parotid, it is cut, getting into two important branches, that is the cervicofacial down and the temporofacial trunk up. Then finally, it is dividing into these five branches. And what are the names of those branches? Temporal branch going here, zygomatic branch going around the zygoma, buccal branch which is going around at the side of the buccal mucosa, Marginal mandibular, which is at the angle of the mandible, and then cervical branch, which is going down in the neck. This is what I was speaking about. Right? So these are the, all the branches. But for you, you need to remember as a clinician how these branches are working. Right? You need to know how people, because you are going to do clinical tests of facial nerve. Now, in order to understand clinical tests of facial nerve, first you need to have a very clear concept that how and where these branches are actually going. What is being supplied by the temporal? What is being supplied by the buccal? You should know, right? So let's draw a face. And this is very important for you to understand the facial nerve because right now, if you understand this, you'll understand what symptoms are being produced. So let's draw a face. Let's draw the eyes of that person. These are the eyes. Right? And then after that, let's draw a nose. There's a nose. And then after that, there's a lip, right. Now, let's put up the eyebrows. This person, let's make this look beautiful. Okay, so this is a person, right? Suppose this is a person sitting in front of you. How do you diagnose whether he has a facial nerve imbalance or not? How? Now, let's see. So, let's draw certain muscles. The first muscle I'm drawing is a scalp muscle here. Another muscle I'm drawing is above the eyebrow. Another muscle I'm drawing is around the eyes. I've drawn three muscles, right? Okay, let's give them a name. This first muscle up, this is called as occipitofrontalis. Scalp, right? Scalp muscle. Second, just above the eyebrow. Corrugator supercilia. Why I'm telling you this, I'll actually tell you how to describe your clinical test. Sorry, this is supercilia. Yeah. So this is the second one, above the eyebrow. Now the third one, around the eyes. So orbicularis oculi. Right? It is around the eyes. So this is orbicularis oculi. Why am I telling you this? Because of the fact, all of these three muscles have been supplied by the first division. So this is the trunk of the facial nerve. This is the first division or the temporal division of the facial nerve supplies the occipitofrontalis. 
supply is a corrugator supercilii, supply is a part to the orbicularis oculi. We know that. Okay. Now let's see the second one. Now the second one is what? The second one, let's make it, let's give it a different color. That is in this part, zygomatic part. So what it has to do with zygomatic things, right? So it is two here, zygomaticus minor, zygomaticus major, levator labi superioris and levator labi superioris aliquonezi. Complex names, okay? So just don't forget, these are very important for you. This is zygomaticus minor, this is zygomaticus major, this is levator labi superioris, that's why it's elevating everything up. Levator labi superioris, right? And this one is called as the shortest muscle with the longest name, that is levator Levi superioris aliquo nasi. Why am I telling you this? I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. So let's give them this. They are supplied by what? Now they are supplied by the second division. That is a zygomatic division. Okay. Okay. Now let's come to the third part. Now what is the third part? Let's see. Let's draw first the muscles of the third part. So there are some muscle which is around the mouth that is called as orbicularis oris around the mouth this is oculi this is around the mouth that is oris now one more muscle that is here that forms a sling right like this this is called as rhizorius and one important muscle here which helps us eat and puff our cheeks that is called as buccinator Let's draw the third division. Third division was what? The buccal division. So the buccal division is supplying the buccinator, orbicularis oris, as well as rhizorius. Coming to the next division. Okay. So this is what? This is the buccal division. Now the next division is what? The next division is the marginal mandibular division. Now, why am I telling you this? I'll come back to it because of the fact you need to understand this so that you can make your own perception as to what is actually happening. Now, we need to make muscles on the angle of the mouth because this is a marginal mandibular. Marginal means at the margin of the mandible, right? So at the angle here, so there is a muscle called this mentalis, which is here. Then there is a triangular muscle called as triangularis. That is a triangular muscle, right? And then after that, there is one small muscle which gets the mouth down. So if this is levator labi uh, superioris, then this will be depressor labi inferioris. Depressor labi inferioris. It's coming down. Right? So this is something to do with the mandible. That is depressor labi inferioris, triangularis and mentalis. This is all down. And what is here in the neck? So let's first get this. This is your marginal mandibular nerve which is supplying all of this. And then comes the last part, that is your cervical, cervical part. And what is the cervical part supplying? Cervical part is supplying a muscle which is present as a sheet in the neck. That is what? Platysma. Okay, so why have I told you all this? Why have I gone into so much of details about all these divisions? Tests of, clasher, of, of the facial nerve. Now once you're dealing with the test or the clinical test, what do you do first? You tell the patient, to look up. So when the patient does up like this, what segment are you actually testing? Wrinkling, right? Temporal division. Who's responsible for it? Occipital frontalis, corrugator supercilii, or vigilis oculi. In order to do this, right? Second test of facial nerve. What are you telling the patient? Close their eyes tightly. Now the person is closing their eyes tightly. What is the muscle? Orbicularis oculi. Where is it getting its supply from? It is getting its supply from a branch of the zygomatic as well as it is getting from a branch from the temporal. Right? Third test. You come down. You tell the patient to smile. The patient smiles like this. And after that, the you tell the person to puff their cheeks. And then you certainly put a finger on the face to see how much strength is there. What are you testing? Buccinator. As well as all the muscles that are around the mouth. Orbicularis oris. Rhizorius. Who is responsible? Buckle division, right? 
Now you come to the marginal mandibular. In the marginal mandibular, when you see a facial palsy and you see a drooping of the angle of the mouth, what is gone? Why does that drooping happen? Because of the fact the mandibular division is not working. The marginal mandibular is damaged. And then comes the cervical. The person will not be able to actually squeeze the neck. So if we say squeeze the neck, we do like this, this is not going to happen. That is why the cervical branch is gone. And that is the reason why I told you all that. Till that level where you start seeing it. You don't need to remember all that. You don't need to remember symptoms. You need to see ENT. You need to see the facial nerve. Fix it inside your brains. Fix that imagination inside the brain that how it is going into various areas. And then after that, you don't need anything required to mug up all these things. It's just imaginative, right? Everything is making sense now. All the things are connected. And that is what I call connecting dots. With the amount of anatomy you know, you'll try to figure out the complex pathologies more. Because if you don't do the anatomy and if you're trying to mug up the pathologies, you won't end up into getting that concept. That's why anatomy has to be strong, solid. Okay, now we come to this extracranial course and summing it up, if you see this particular thing, these are just the five branches, but they look like this, right? They look like this. That's why we give it an appearance. We call it a goose feet appearance. So we call this appearance as goose feet. And we have given it a name. We call it pest and silliness. So this is what we call it goose feet or pest and silliness. When it divides into various branches and it is supplying. Okay? Right. So the branches and distribution, just to make you clear with what we did right now, we did that there were certain branches to the facial nerve which were inside and some were outside. So within the facial canal, we saw that how the greater superficial petrosal nerve came out from the geniculate ganglion and went for lacrimation. We saw the motor branch that is the nerve to stapedius. Then we saw the corner tympani which was carrying the taste fibers inside. And then it was going with the fibers of the motor branch. Now, once it came out from the stylomastoid foramen, we said that one of the branches went behind the ear, that is the posterior auricular nerve, and the other ones went to the derivatives of the second branchial arch. That was what? That is the posterior belly of the digastric, the stylohyoid. Right? As simple as that. Once the main branch entered into the parotid gland, it had split up into two important branches, that is the cervicofacial and the temporofacial branches, and that further divided into these five major branches, which we called as pesanceriness. So they look like goose feet. There are some nerves which communicate in between. So we just give them small branches which are communicating as a name as communicating branches. These have been just a name that is given to them, but they have no important role as far as these are concerned. But these are the main ones, as well as the intrapetrous part. That is the main one. They are the main branches of the facial nerve. Right. Now, you have known that the facial nerve is coming from the pons and getting out up till the parotid gland. So you have to have its blood supply around. Every nerve has its blood supply, right? It has got its own peculiar blood supply. So let's make that blood supply for you. So it is coming from the brainstem, you know that. This is the midbrain, the pons, and there's a the medulla. Then you know it is entering into a meatal part. Then after that, it is entering into a part that is the middle ear, where it is making all those complex connections that we have seen. And I believe that you won't be learning or mugging up, you would be seeing them, right? Okay, and so let's trace that facial nerve. Suppose this is the nucleus of the facial nerve. It's coming like this. It's going, it is forming a ganglion here. It is coming down like this, and then through the stylomastoid foramen, out into the extracranial part, which is five. Right, now let's see the blood supply. So what is the blood supply of this particular facial nerve. So according to the areas, they have divided that blood supply. So let's see. If you remember the brainstem, you remember one important artery that is there, and that is the ICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, that runs along the brainstem like this. So this is the ICA, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now what is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery going to give? This is going to give a branch here to this segment, the segment that is coming out from the pons. Right? That is the intrapontine segment and then the posterior cranial fossa segment. So this angle is called as a cerebellopontine angle. It is nothing complex, it is just an angle between the cerebellum and the pons, where this will be seen. Right? So this first part or the intracranial part is getting its supply from anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Okay, so this part we have done. Anterior inferior cerebellar artery providing its supply in the first part. Now comes the second part. Now if you see the second part, the second part will be what? This will be inside this internal acoustic meatus. 
and this internal acoustic meatus part will also gain its supply where it is going to get its supply from ICA, but this uh, vessel is called as a labyrinthine vessel or a labyrinthine artery. Just a name. So this labyrinthine artery is going to supply this part, the meatal part of the facial lung. Right? It is also a direct branch from ICA. Now let's come down. Now when we come down, there is an important another vessel in the brain and that is called as what? That's called as a menin middle meningeal artery. Now this middle meningeal artery will give off an important artery that is called as superficial petrosal artery. And this superficial petrosal artery will definitely give a branch which is here to this nearby parts and to the geniculate ganglion. Right? So this is going to cover the rest of the part. And then comes the last part because now everything is coming out through the stylomastoid foramen. So definitely through this part it has to be supplied by something of a similar name that is stylomastoid artery. Now this stylomastoid artery is a branch of posterior auricular artery. Posterior auricular artery is a branch of external carotid artery. Simple. Right? So four vessels that are supplying it. So the first one is the IACA that is supplying the intracranial part. Then it is a labyrinthine branch of IACA which is supplying the meatal part. Then it is a superficial petrosal branch of the middle meningeal artery which is supplying the geniculate ganglion and the structures nearby. And then after that once the thing has come out, the facial nerve is out, it has been supplied by the stylomastoid artery. And this stylomastoid artery is a branch of posterior auricular artery and posterior auricular artery is a branch of external carotid artery. So this is supplying all that part, the mastoid part, and once the facial nerve comes out. Easy? So we have seen the blood supply majorly by four vessels. Right? So we need to remember that because this is very important. These arteries carry a very important role. So now if you remember the story, you have got the idea what I was talking about. I spoke about a boy and he had all these things. He made his face. So it was the muscles of facial expression. That is the main function of the, of the facial nerve and that is why we respect it so much. Production of tears, very important to express emotions directly coming up from the lacrimal gland. We all love food and definitely that taste of food is given by this specific nerve from the gorda tympani, right? And the last is a sensation. When the mother twisted those ears, carried pain sensation. And that is why it also has a sense of touch and pain which goes to the brainstem via sensory fibers. So these are the main functions of the facial nerve. And we have seen to that level how they are produced how each and every nerve segment produces each and everything. And now you will never forget because of the fact you know in depth of what all and where all the facial nerve goes. It is complex, but it is easy if you understand and it will stick to your brain. Right? Okay. So one important thing before you have a clear cut concept about the facial nerve, and this is going to be asked in examination point of view, that what are the pointers for facial nerve? So when I say surgical pointers means I'm doing a certain surgery. And I need to see these pointers in order to find out my facial nerve. Because they are identification areas. Right? So what are these pointers? These surgical pointers are usually we need to find these pointers when we are doing a parotidectomy. Or when we are uh, cutting off the parotid gland, the superficial lobe of the parotid gland because the facial nerve is right next to it. So what all are the areas? So if you see, first, what is this muscle? This is called as a posterior belly of diagastric. And I told you that posterior belly of diagastric has got a direct branch from the facial nerve. This is the most important landmark for when spatial nerve identification is concerned. So posterior belly of the digastric, just see the nerve will run parallel and above this of, of this belly. So superior and parallel to the posterior belly of digastric is the first landmark to find the facial nerve. That is first landmark. Digastric muscle, posterior belly. Now let's come to the second landmark. If you see the styloid process, it is lying lateral to the styloid. So lateral to the styloid process is the facial nerve. So during surgery, if we find the styloid process, definitely we are near the facial. We have to be careful, otherwise we'll injure it. Now let's come to the third landmark. Third landmark is what, if, if, if you consider this, this is looking like a cartilage, right? What cartilage is this? If you see this, this is a tragus. So if you dissect out, or if you do a parotidectomy or reflect this, you will definitely see this tragal cartilage projecting out. So when you go into the depth of this, this cartilage will end. And this will form a projection. And that is what we call it as a cartilaginous pointer. So the cartilaginous pointer is nothing, but it is the cartilage which we dissect out. And this cartilage, one centimeter below or inferior to this, will be the facial nerve. 
So this is a cartilage or this is a pointer and around about one centimeter inferior to it is the facial lamp. So if we have dissected this and we have got the end of this, definitely we'll come to know that yes, our facial nerve is next to us. We have to be careful and we have to identify the trunk. Last one is, I cannot show it here in this diagram, but you just remember it's called as tympanomastoid suture line. So what is tympanomastoid suture? It is nothing if you go on dissecting in this area, a suture will be seen between the tympanic part of the temporal bone and the mastoid part. So mastoid part is this, tympanic part is the one which is which is going to be uh, the one which uh, which is covering the tympanic membrane. That's called as a tympanic membrane. So at the junction of the tympano and the mastoid, there is a suture and that is called as tympanomastoid suture. And six to eight millimeters inferiorly and medially, we will find the facial nerve. Okay, so these are the pointers we need to know. Posterior belly of the digastric, the cartilaginous or the tragal pointer, styloid process, and the tympanomastoid suture line. So where is a uh, tympanomastoid suture line? In between the tympanic part and the mastoid segment. And then after that, anterior, inferior to it, six to eight millimeters down, you will find the facial nerve. You just need to remember these because they can be asked as a one marker in your exams. That what are the common markers or the pointers that you see in facial nerve identification. So let's sum up what we did today. We did a lot of things. We have traced actually each and every segment in detail. And I hope that from now on you'll start relating symptoms to anatomy because that is the logic behind it. You cannot mug up a cranial nerve. You have to think according to it, how the cranial nerve is behaving. Okay, so it is the seventh cranial nerve. We have seen that it has got the motor root and a sensory root, and it is a second branchial arch nerve because it is supplying that. Right? Then we went into a detailed discussion about the saltatory conduction, that why it is myelinated, why we need a conduction velocity so far so that we can produce so many things such as facial expressions. We discussed about what are the motor nuclei. So there were two motor nuclei. Then we discussed about the sensory nuclei. That is how the afferents are coming and how the efferents are going. And we discussed each and every part of it. We discussed in detail how these segments are running forward. Then after that, we discussed the course right from the intracranial part to the petrous part and how the facial canal is divided into three parts. And when it becomes through the stylomastoid foramen, it is called as the extracranial part of the facial nerve. After that, broadly, four broad divisions we made and we discussed the branches. So this is the rule of four. Rule of four means that we discuss the branches and distribution in four broad divisions. That's how you can remember and you won't miss out things in the branches. Then definitely we did four vessels that are coming off from different arteries of the brain and they are supplying various segments of the facial nerve. And then we did the four important roles. So if you remember the story, those were the four roles of the facial nerve, what we had discussed. And then after that, we had surgical pointers when it considers parotid surgery in specific, that what are the surgical four pointers of the facial nerve, right? So this is the whole scenario of what we have gone through in this lecture on facial nerve. Fine, so we have got something really interesting to see, imagine, and introspect why things are happening. That is why I always say you try connecting when it comes to cranial nerves, because then only you will find these answers. Why a person is smiling? Why a person is crying? Why a person is tasting food? Why there is so much of salivation suddenly when someone eats food? And now we have got all the answers to it. We have detailed, described everything, and we have opened the book. And now I think this thing won't be a fear to you. Because facial nerve is the most important nerve inside the human body.